Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today and good morning from London. Thank you for joining our presentation on the Lazarus Group's use of the DTRAC Remote Access Trojan. And we're going to be performing a retrospective analysis of the various campaigns that we've observed over the years. My name is John Southworth and I am a Senior Threat Intelligence Analyst at PwC UK. I primarily focus on tracking threat actors based in the Asia Pacific region and I've been tracking North Korea based threat actors for the past few years. And instead, I don't know if you can see me. Um, hi, I'm Saba. I'm also a senior threat intelligence analyst at PLBC UK. I also focus on threat actors based in the Asia Pacific region. But instead of doing comparative malware in university, I used to do uh, comparative literature instead. So that's a bit of a jump there. And speaking of jumps, let's go right into our agenda for the day. So we thought we'd start to talk a bit about the Lazarus Group, whether you know them already or not. And we're going to give a brief timeline of the most high profile operations that have been attributed to Lazarus Group. We're also going to be touch on the different ways in which Lazarus Group is tracked across the industry and touch on some of the subgroups and aliases that the Lazarus Group is known as. And then we're going to go into the DTRAC Remote Access Trojan, and we're going to trace its evolution, its different characteristics and functionality, and take a look at some of the campaigns where DTRAC was used as a payload. From there, we're going to look at DTRAC's dropper, track drop, as we call it, and how we have observed track drop working and dropping some tools associated with Lazarus and other tools associated with a Lazarus subgroup that is known as Andario, including a downloader, which is fairly sophisticated and which we know as Anonyber. Talking about the Anonyber downloader, which is associated with Andario, we're also going to be talking about Anonyber's connections to another Andario tool, the backdoor Rift door. And then we're going to pull all these threads together, look at how all of this is connected to Lazarus and what this tells us about Lazarus operations. And finally, we're going to give a bit of insight into how defenders and end users can protect themselves from DTRAC campaigns. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to John, who's going to be talking to us about the Lazarus Group. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Seba. So I imagine that most of us listening to this presentation have already heard of the Lazarus Group. But if you haven't, I'll do a quick overview. It is a North Korea based threat actor that has been active since approximately 2007. And on the right hand side of this screen, you can see several of the well known campaigns that have been attributed back to the Lazarus Group. Now, Lazarus Group is not the only name that this threat actor is known by. And internally at PwC, we track the Lazarus Group under the name Black Artemis. It is also known in open source, which a name that has been given to it by the US government as Hidden Cobra. Now, what is interesting about the Lazarus Group is that its motivations have been changing over time. And on this slide, you will see several of the motivations associated with it, namely that of espionage. It's well known for its espionage campaigns, which focus on stealing information from organizations for the purposes of turning it into actionable intelligence. But perhaps it is more well, no um, well known recently for its campaigns that target organizations for the purposes of cybercrime that is financially motivated campaigns. But originally the Lazarus Group was also known for its campaigns that were targeting organizations for the purposes of sabotage. That is, they have more of a destructive or disruptive angle. Now in the threat intelligence community, it's sometimes hard to come to a consensus of what the term Lazarus Group actually means. After all, it is a threat actor that has been around for a long time and its motivations have been evolving. What I can say is that within PwC, the way that we track this intrusion set that is known as Black Artemis spans these three motivations that you can see on this slide, that being sabotage, espionage and cybercrime. Now this name Black Artemis also aligns with the open source names that I've also mentioned, that being Lazarus Group and Hidden Cobra. And throughout this presentation, we'll be using the terms Black Artemis and Lazarus Group interchangeably. However, there are also other ways to track subgroups of the Lazarus Group, as you can see on this slide. 
For instance, in the column describing the Lazarus Group's sabotage campaigns, a known subgroup or also an alias of this group is called Dark Soul, which was originally known for targeting organizations in South Korea with the purposes of sabotage, i.e. through denial of service attacks. But also on the far right, you can see in the cybercrime column, there are a couple of names that can be used to specifically track the subgroups of Lazarus that focus on financial crime, specifically APT38 and Blue Norrell. One that is also worth pointing out is the subgroup of Lazarus, uh, known as Andariel, that we assess spans both the motivations of espionage and cybercrime. And it's worth pointing out that all of these are still a part of this Lazarus umbrella, but you may be asking why don't we track them in this more specific way? And the reason we do that is that we are seeing an overlap in the tools that it uses for the purposes of espionage, with also for the purposes of cybercrime. So for instance, a remote access Trojan that we'll see being used in an espionage campaign would also then be reused in a different campaign targeting a completely different organization for a different motivation, i.e. cybercrime. So on this slide, we've mapped out a timeline of some of the really well-known Lazarus Group campaigns. And the way we've done this is that we've named the campaign and given the year and a brief description of what that campaign involved. So early on in the timeline, you'll be able to see campaigns that were more focused on sabotage, such as Operation Flame and Operation Troy, which were well known to be targeting South Korea. As we go through the timeline, there are more focuses on espionage campaigns, such as Operation Blockbuster, and the further we go, we can start to see more and more cybercrime focused campaigns as well, such as the well known Bank of Bangladesh heist and targeting of the Bank of Chile. If we get up to the modern day, we start to get onto the topic of this presentation, which we started tracking in late 2019, where the Lazarus Group used a tool known as DTRAC. So, what is DTRAC? DTRAC is a remote access Trojan that has been used by Black Artemis since at least 2014. The name DTRAC itself comes from the Kaspersky blog released in late 2019, where they named this tool. We assess from our research that there are also a couple of other names that are associated with this tool, specifically Preft, which is the Symantec name for it, and Hadesbot, which is the CrowdStrike name for it. We released reporting internally at PwC on these various campaigns at the end of 2019 and the beginning of 2020, which builds up the basis of all this research. Now, I've been calling DTRAC a remote access Trojan so far, but it's a little bit more nuanced than that. In fact, when we were tracking it, we found that earlier variants of DTRAC were closer to back doors. That is, they weren't so much there to interact with the file system of the infected machine in depth, and were more so there to provide basic functionality and drop further tools. Whereas later on, we found that DTRAC was more close to a fully fledged rat in that it could perform a lot of capabilities that the back doors could, but also exfiltrate data as well for the threat actor's use. And in the next slide, we're going to be breaking down these capabilities as we've observed them over time as such. And you can see this is broken down into almost two sections. At the top, we have two capabilities that we have observed being consistent with all DTRAC samples that we have picked up. The first being the capability to download a file to the infected system, and the second being the ability to change the time between beacons to the command and control servers. We have also seen the abilities to run shell commands and remove persistence and exit from the remote access Trojan. But there are slight gaps in these capabilities where they weren't present. Now we can explain away some of those with some of the capabilities that were also present that would fill up those gaps. But these four capabilities at the top make up what we call the core build of DTRAC. As we go through the rest of these capabilities though, we start to see the changes over time. In the color yellow, you can see all of the capabilities that are more associated with the backdoor variants of DTRAC. And in orange, the capabilities associated with the remote access Trojan variants 
with 2017 being the pivotal year between them changing these capabilities. So for instance, for the back door, there are various capabilities such as downloading and immediately executing a file, performing code injection, or executing shell code within the same process. These are all more experimental features as they only appear for very short amounts of time and then are seemingly never used again. One capability I want to highlight, which is at the top of this section, is this removing persistent mechanisms if they've been set and immediately executing a file. Now this could be explained by the Lazarus group using this capability to remove DTRAC and then install a new implant, maybe a new remote access trojan that it wants to use. But some security researchers have also speculated that DTRAC has been used to deploy more tools for the purposes of sabotage, such as disk wipers. And this capability could also explain that. But going back to the end of it, from this year 2017 onwards, all of these experimental features were gone, and instead we're left with the two capabilities of exfiltrating files and getting the current configuration of the remote access trojan, which builds up a stable build of DTRAC that is used consistently from 2017 onwards. So let's dive into the internals of DTRAC a bit more in depth. Before any malicious code is executed by DTRAC, it must perform its initialization routine. This consists of generating a victim ID, which is made by combining the values such as the computer name and the hardware ID of the infected system. It will then gather some basic system information, such as the operating system type and the IP address of the infected machine. And finally, it will decode a number of hard-coded command and control server addresses. And you can see this at a high level on the right-hand side of the slide. A nice feature that you can also see on this slide in the bottom left is a screenshot where very kindly of the threat actor, they, or rather a mistake on their part, they forgot to remove their debug logging messages, which spells out the key functionality of these samples. And in this case, you can see that it's begun the main thread and that the initialization has finished successfully. So how are these strings decoded? How are these C2 addresses actually decoded? Well, we have observed three variants of the string decoding routines being used in DTRAC. In particular, we have seen RC4 being used to decode the strings with a hard-coded key stored within the binary itself. We've seen a method of XOR being used where a one-byte key is stored at the beginning of the string and then used to subsequently decode the rest of the string. And we have seen a variant or multiple variants where strings are prepended with the characters CCS underscore and are then removed at runtime. Now, the kind of strings that are encoded by these routines are, as mentioned, the C2s, but also things like the API functions and format strings that might want to be used. And you can see an example of this routine on the right, where this routine has the capability to decode CCS underscore strings and XOR strings. So in combination with this string decoding routine, DTRAC for the most part will perform a technique known as dynamic API loading. This is where rather than having all of your imports and Windows APIs stored in your import address table, instead they are all loaded at runtime using the Windows APIs load library and get prop address. This can make static analysis harder as you won't see these APIs present in the binary using only static analysis tools. And this is actually a technique that is quite consistently used by Black Artemis or the Lazarus group. It's not unique to the Lazarus group, but it is informative that they carry on using this technique in most of their tools. This technique combined with the string encoding can make DTRAC a bit of a pain to analyze statically but we developed some Ghidra scripts internally just to make our lives a bit easier to automatically decode these strings and to help us retype these libraries. So for the most part, I've been describing features of DTRAC that are consistent across all samples. But I want to talk about a few features over the next few slides that we've only observed in a couple of samples. Again, sometimes more experimental features. 
In this case, we've observed a couple of persistence mechanisms being set by the DTRAC remote access trojan. Specifically, we have seen them use uh, a service using the SC command to create a service that will automatically execute when the user logs in. And we've also seen them dropping shortcut links into the user's startup folder that will again execute DTRAC's dropper at runtime. We'll be talking about the dropper a little bit later on. And as I've said, not all of these samples have a persistence mechanism. This was more observed in older samples towards 2014, 2015 variants of DTRAC. And I quite quickly want to go over a couple of different techniques that we've seen DTRAC use to try and evade analysis. The first being antivirus evasion. Specifically, we have seen some DTRAC variants look for file paths and running processes associated with the ARMLAB antivirus software. And even so far as going to try and destroy the windows that are associated with the AB process. This is interesting in of itself, as ARMLAB is a South Korean antivirus vendor and could indicate some targeting. There is also a technique we've seen used in some DTRAC samples that will evade sandboxes. And this is done by using the Windows API get cursorpos to get the position of the mouse cursor and not continue executing until the mouse cursor has moved. This can be defeated by a lot of modern sandboxes by simulating mouse movement. But given this was present in older samples, it might have been enough back then to actually evade sandboxes. There are a couple of more anti-analysis techniques that we've observed as well, including an anti-virtualization technique that would look for the VMware drag and drop folder and a few cases where DTRAC would look for the following running processes that you can see in the bottom right, including Process Explorer, Wireshark, and Process Monitor, standard tools that are associated with malware analysis. So I've been focusing on the capabilities of DTRAC so far, and I quickly want to touch on some of the command and control features. So as I said before, at the beginning of its initialization, DTRAC will decode between two to five hard-coded URLs. For the most part, we've seen them decoding three URLs, but this has varied over time. Most of these URLs contain domains themselves. And from our analysis, we assess that most of the domains observed are likely compromised infrastructure being used to host the Lazarus Group's command and control servers. However, we've seen some interesting cases where Rather than a domain being used, we've seen IP addresses being used. And more specifically, we've seen internal IP addresses being used for command and control. This likely indicates that the Lazarus group has embedded their command and control servers within a victim organization's network and are using them for command and control. C2 is done over HTTP, as you can see on some images on the right-hand side of this slide but the communications are encrypted using a custom cryptography routine. Right, so John has kindly given us a very good technical deep dive into DTRAC, but I thought that maybe we could take a look also at some of the campaigns that DTRAC has been used as a payload in. Um, so both from a geographic and sectorial and motivation perspective. Firstly, we've seen a variant of DTRAC called ATM DTRAC by Kaspersky being used in targeting of financial institutions, for example, for the purposes of ATM cash out attacks. But we've used DTRAC mostly being used for espionage purposes. For example, Palo Alto Unit 42 actually reported that what we assess is a DTRAC variant, which they call TDRAC2, was used to target transportation and logistics companies in Europe. We've seen DTRAC mostly deployed against South Korean targets, but then in late 2019, several Indian organizations, including the Indian Space Research Organization and Kundankulam Nuclear Power Plant, reported that they had been compromised with DTRAC. Now, as John mentioned, there also have been reports that DTRAC might have been used to execute disk wipers and other sabotage-oriented malware. We have not observed evidence of this firsthand, but we cannot rule out, based on the capabilities of DTRAC, that this could have been a possibility. Now, let's take 
a closer look at the KKNPP incident because it's been a pretty big headline and it's also a very particular case of use of DTRAC. So let's start. And what we have here on screen is a sample that we assess was highly likely used in the KKNPP intrusion. Now, the sample works like this. There is a portable executable dropper, which has been patched to lead to a decryption routine, which decrypts an encrypted overlay and then loads the decrypted payload into memory, which is a DTRAC standard thing. But this sample is particularly tailored to the victim environment, and we're going to get to that in a second. Now, if we look at the structure of the binary, we have a win main function, which contains three main subroutines, which neatly subdivide the main functionality of DTRAC. Firstly, we have a subroutine that takes care of initialization and of the Windows libraries import, which we can see on screen here on the right, is done with the CCS underscore obfuscation, which is a fairly trivial obfuscation method if we think about it, but actually might have been just about enough to bypass static signaturing methods or any kind of like static detection. Then we go into another subroutine, which takes care of victim fingerprinting and identification. And then there's a third function, which actually contains the huge chunk of the main DTRAC functionality and the ability to actually look more in depth at the victim and at the file system. So victim fingerprinting and identification in the KKMPP DTRAC sample are done pretty much as is DTRAC standard. So we'll have a victim ID, which comprises of computer name, Windows owner and Windows copy organization, as well as some hardware information. And the KKMPP DTRAC sample will also, like other DTRAC samples, gather the machine operating system and local IP. But then that's where the differences with the standard DTRAC build begin. Because in this case, we have no external IP addresses being decrypted, and we have no external C2s and no configuration files. Rather, we just go into the main chunk of functionality and we jump into much deeper victim fingerprinting, which is affected through a whole series of sequential command line commands that are just run one after the other. So you can see on the screen here, a task list or netstat, and the results of all of these commands that have been run on the victim system are then logged into specific files, which as you can see on the top, are saved in a folder called temp within the user's normal temp folder. You can never have enough temps. Um, and then after this is done, all of these files will be packaged up in a compressed archive and password protected. The KKMPP DTRAC sample will also gather browsing and internet data, which is saved in a folder, again, in the temp, temp folder, with the name of the machine's local IP address. Only after all of this information has been captured, the malware will try to reach an internal IP. And if a connection is possible, it will go on to further functionality. If it's not, it will stop executing. Now, if it has reached this internal IP address, which is in the 192 range, the malware will then proceed to enumerate drives and files present on the victim machine's file system. And again, package up all this information that it has collected and compress it in a password protected archive. We've mentioned that the sample is highly tailored. And if this is not already interesting enough, the exfiltration method that the sample uses will definitely be. So what we see here is that this sample also contains a whole series of hard-coded commands using net in order to mount a network share onto another internal IP we see here in the 10 network range using hard-coded account credentials and which are specific with the compromised environment. We see that it's trying to mount a network share on a domain controller. So this is very distinctive and very relevant for a whole series of reasons. Firstly, because what we're looking at here is not really a backdoor. Well, we would have a normal DTRAC sample in its main chunk of functionality, having a huge jump table interpreting commands received from the C2 and then taking further action based on the command received and then feeding back information. 
There is none of that here. There is no interaction with SC2. What we have instead is basically an info stealer uh, with just a whole series of hardcoded commands. This is not going to download any further payloads. It's just going to execute whatever is hardcoded in the sample and then exfiltrate the results. So what does this tell us? That firstly, the binary has been almost carved out of its main functionality and replaced with these specific ad hoc capabilities. But also that the threat actor would have needed to have a very deep level of penetration of the KK and PP network in order to firstly move laterally. Secondly, compromise the domain controller and be able to use it for staging of exfiltrated information. And thirdly, to even pinpoint systems of interest on which to drop these tailored D-truck samples to then perform information stealing. And we also need to remember that D-truck is not a standalone executable. It, it's not like it just arrives magically in victim systems. It needs to have a prior foothold. The track drop dropper needs to arrive there somehow in the first place, all of which requires prior compromise of the environment. And now let's look at a bit of an Easter egg, which are the links to Lazarus. Now, KKMPP D-Track is effectively D-Track. The binary structure is exactly the same, and you can tell that the code base is the same. What is changed is that it's almost been carved out like a pumpkin, and then the ad hoc has been added in in its place. We can also have a few very interesting details. For example, one of the passwords that is used to encrypt the compressed archives is the one DKWERO38, etc. Now, that's such a well known Lazarus password that VirusTotal actually ended up using it as a case study for their IDA Pro project. Plugin. So it's pretty much an convention, And it actually dates back all the way to the days of Operation Troy, which was a series of destructive and disruptive attacks on South Korean targets in 2009. So we're seeing the same password a decade later. Now, a caveat here, very huge caveat. This may well be a threat actor convention. We also know that false flag operations are very much a thing. But we also know that malware-based attribution is very much limited. And so the important thing to remember here is that whenever we're looking at an intrusion, it's not enough to just look at the malware and say, yep, this is this, or to look at these details. You also need to be looking at the tactics, techniques, and procedures involved in the intrusion, as well as the infrastructure in order to be able to make a comprehensive assessment. So we also said, that D-Track effectively is loaded in memory. It's not a standalone executable and it doesn't really touch disk. So how does it get there? Maybe John can tell us. Thank you very much. So as Weber has highlighted, D-Track is never saved to disk in a standard format. So how do we track it? If it's never saved to disk, it's never going to be easily shared on online multi-antivirus scanners, for example. What we found through our analysis is that D-Track is dropped by a unique dropper that we call Track Drop and has been around since at least 2014, i.e. the same time that D-Track campaigns began. Track Drop also goes by a couple of other names that we assess are similar in open source, including Export Control and T-Drop2. Although the connection to T-Drop2 itself is a little bit more nuanced and we'll get onto that in a few slides. So what is TrackDrop itself? For the most part, TrackDrop binaries are benign executables that have been patched or modified in order to execute a, a unique cryptography routine that will decode a payload stored in the encrypted overlay of the portable executable and then run it. The nice thing about this unique cryptography routine is that we were able to go away and using Yara, signature this cryptography routine. And then we were able to use this to track all of the track drop samples that we have observed over the last few years from 2014 onwards. Now there are two variants of track drop that we have observed. The first loads D track into the same process as track drop itself. But for the more common variants, we see it use a slightly more complicated process of hollowing a randomly selected system binary and loading D-Track 
into that process, i.e. process Halloween. So for the most part, we've observed track drop dropping D-track samples, but not exclusively. In fact, through our analysis, we found that track drop also drops a suite of other tools, including downloaders, this is where T-drop2 comes into play, key loggers, and then slightly more out there, bank phishing pages, and even a case where it was dropping some adware. So we'll also be talking a little bit later about another sample that is dropped by TrackDrop, which we call the Anoniva downloader. So by taking DTrack and pivoting back to TrackDrop, we were able to map out all these various tools being used by the Lazarus group and detail them. So let's start talking about the downloaders. Now, this is where the connection to TDrop2 comes in. And it's a little bit more complicated than just saying track drop and TDrop2 are the same. Incidentally, we named the, down, uh, the dropper track drop independently of TDrop2. So the names are just being similar, just a coincidence. But track drop more refers to the component that is used to perform the process hollowing or code injection, whereas TDrop2 appears to more describe the complete set of the dropper and the downloader. So how does the downloader work? What it does is that it will download a payload from the C2, save it to disk with a file with a .exe extension, and then we'll overwrite the first two bytes of the file with the values mz, that is the DOS header magic value. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to execute properly without it. And then we'll subsequently execute that payload. Open source research that we've looked at, specifically Palo Alto's um, analysis on TDrop2 and the payload that it drops, we assess are likely, highly likely consistent with that track being served by these downloaders. Track drop samples have also been observed dropping key loggers and screenshot gathering modules as independent samples that will save these uh, key logging files to disk. This is a technique that we've seen the Lazarus group use before, specifically in financially motivated campaigns, where rather than having their key loggers and screenshot gatherers automatically exfiltrate this data to a command and control server. Instead, they are saved to disk, and it is up to whatever remote access Trojan is running on the system to exfiltrate that data for the threat actor's use. In this case, you can see on the right an example key log output, and this will be stored to disk in a compressed archive encrypted with the password that you can see on screen. Now, a 2017 variant of this keylogger also had the capability to gather screenshots of the infected system, but this was later removed in a 2018 variant. So this is where some of these samples being dropped by TrackDrop get a little bit odd. In this, in the case of TrackDrop, we saw it dropping this HTML page that you can see on the right, which is masquerading as a banking page, or almost an email for an Indian bank claiming that the user's account has been compromised and they need to input their details. Note that this is a campaign that is targeting customers of a bank, and there is no evidence to suggest that it is targeting the bank itself. While we couldn't obtain the next stage when we would go through that click here to update sign, it is highly likely that this would be some form of credential or financial information phishing. But what's even more strange about this sample of track drop is that it didn't just drop this banking phishing page, but also dropped a sample that we call the Anoniba downloader, which Sever is going to talk more about. Yep. So what is this Anoniba downloader that we have been mentioning for the past 20 minutes? Thank you, John, for the introduction. Anoniver is a downloader that from the limits of our visibility and collection we assess has been used by the Black Artemis intrusion set since at least 2016. And the name comes from the Anoniber string, which is used as the key to decrypt the strings of this downloader. Now, the way Anoniber gets on the victim system is via the standard track drop installation routine. But there are a few added caution and anti-analysis tricks which are interesting to touch on. 
Firstly, a sandbox check, which you can see here on screen and which is incidentally the same as the one seen in a 2014 variant of DTRAC. So we have here a 2016 downloader, a different malware family, being dropped by the same dropper that is associated with DTRAC samples and which also embeds code taken from 2014 DTRAC. That's a bit of a connection there. Now, Anonibur also performs an antivirus check. The samples that we observed specifically checked for Kaspersky and Quick Heal antivirus by trying to read whether there were any registry keys associated with these AVs. If any of them was present on the victim system, then Anonibur would record it and then would actually append data to the end of its own binary in order to potentially change its hash and bypass hash-based detection. Anonibur would also check whether a mutex of global Anonibur was present on the victim system. And if it was, then the binary would stop executing. Otherwise, it would go on to further functionality, such as persistence, which in this case was affected by placing a link file in the user startup folder, masquerading as a Windows updater, which is a technique that we're seeing Lazarus use up to the present day, for example, in its blinding can campaigns. In terms of Anonibur's functionality, the downloader would just loop back to a payload staging server until it got a positive response. And it then would download a payload and then prepend the MZ header on it, very similar to TROP2 actually. And then it would set persistence for this payload and execute it. After doing this, Anonibur would proceed to empty the file of track drop that existed on disk but not by deleting the entire file, just by emptying all of its contents and leaving behind only the letters BM. Now, this is a very interesting detail because BM is a very well-known Lazarus and Andariel typical encoding for the DOS header MZ. We can see here in 2016 in the Sony Pictures hack incident, Novetta's Operation Blockbuster report detailed how the India Whiskey Lazarus tool had its first two bytes being BM. And a 2018 Anlab presentation also touched on an Andario specific backdoor known as BM door, which would also use the BM header. And it's also interesting as an anti forensics techniques because investigators could not maybe get back the original track drop file and would only see this random file with only the BM letters left in it, which would be a bit odd. But let's look a bit closer at the Anonibur encryption and what it reveals to us about its connection to Andario. So the Anonibur encryption works like this. We have a custom impl implementation of RC4 with key Anonibur, and then we also have got Base64 encoding. And this same exact mechanism of hiding strings from simple analysis was found in a 2019 variant of an Andarial backdoor known as Riftdoor. Now, Riftdoor is a longstanding, well known Andarial tool, which Unlab published a really cool report about. It's been in use since at least 2014, when it was a very basic, very lightweight backdoor with limited functionality. But then in 2019, we observed a reloaded version of Riftdoor, which used an Anibur encryption mechanism and had so much added functionality, including, for example, the possibility of spawning a reverse shell on the victim system. So it went from a lightweight backdoor to a fully fledged rat. And if we look here, we can see kind of like the connections that start multiplying. So we have track drop, which is associated with the D-track Lazarus Trojan, dropping the 2016 version of the Anonibur downloader. And then we see the same encryption three years later in a 2019 sample of Riftdoor, which is uniquely associated with Andario. So a lot of connections there. And it's by no means the end of it. We've said track drop drops T-track and also Anonibur. Anonibur leads us to Riftdoor. Fast forward to February 2020, and US CISA releases indicators on two malware families one of which it calls hot croissant, which never fails to make me really hungry, and another one which is known as Bistro Math. Now, in our analysis of hot croissant of a few samples compiled in 2018, we realized that actually hot croissant was a sort of 
baby version or early version of the 2019 variant or, of RIFTOR. And what I mean by this is that the structure of the binary was effectively the same, but with smaller chunks of functionality and fewer command and control codes. But then in turn, from this connection, we also found that Bistrovanth and Hot Croissant actually had a similar cryptographic routine, which was not publicly known before. So it was a pretty strong connection there. And furthermore, Bistromath itself then had in some samples, the same exact string encoding to D-track with the CCS underscore method. So we have this like absolute loop of connections round and around. And what you're gonna ask me right now is why do we care? What do you do this for? What does this mean? And to be honest, you're right. But let me get a bit more serious for one moment. Now, the reason why this is important is because what we have here is several tools that are attributed to some Lazarus group, some to Andario, which is a Lazarus subgroup. But what our analysis shows is that we can make a reasonable assessment that all these tools highly likely stem from a same code base, or at the very least, reuse the same code chunks. And there is this idea of iterating on or rehashing an established code base in order to make new malware families or embed tricks that work from a malware family into another. And there is this concept of like slipping up on habits in the coding stuff. So at least from a development standpoint, there's a connection. And it also hints to the fact that Lazarus and Andario are not in fact separate entities. They've been linked in the past, but very much from our assessment, it's highly likely that they continue to be linked. And it also, all of this analysis gives us a window of insight into the development modus operandi of Black Artemis as an intrusion set, which has a very sprawling tool set, new additions very often. But then all of these tie back to an established code base. And then there's also this idea of really investing into an implant that has been developed and kind of maintaining it and then iterating on it. And then in some cases, even tailoring it to specific intrusions, like we saw with the KKNPP case. And what, if we take a step back, what does this tell us about D-Track and about the Lazarus crew? Thank you. So D-Track, has been well known for its use in campaigns that are targeting organizations for the purposes of espionage, as we've highlighted in this presentation. But not only that, it is a dual tool with multiple purposes, i.e. through the research that was released by Kaspersky detailing ATM D-Track, a variant of D-Track focused on dumping the ATM tracks of compromised um, ATM machines, this was focused on financially motivated campaigns. Now this use of tooling, as we've mentioned before, for both the purposes of espionage and cybercrime continues to be seen through our tracking of the Lazarus group. In particular, the remote access Trojan known as Manuscript and recently analyzed by the, the US CISA team, Blinding Can, or we, what we call internally as Show State, has also been used for the dual purposes of espionage and cybercrime. But not only that, through our D-Track analysis, this, these campaigns can be tied back to previous campaigns, including T-Drop2 and subsequently T-Drop, which was a part of Operation Troy, which are campaigns with the purposes of sabotage. So this remote access Trojan and in general Lazarus code has been developed since at least 2009 and continues to be seen in samples even in this year. Now, it's important to point out that despite our thorough investigation of D-Track, we've not seen it being used again since these prolific campaigns at the end of 2019. This could likely be explained due to the fact that there was a lot of public reporting on it at the time and the threat actor might have been spooked up a bit. But that doesn't rule out the fact that in the future, they may use this tool again. And all of this research will enable us to carry on tracking it and has also led us on to tracking further malware families used by Lazarus. So what can we say about the Lazarus group as a result of all this? Well, it's Lazarus still being Lazarus really, but with 
it's constant adapting and iterating on its previous campaigns. From the perspective of espionage, it continues to go over the same kind of targets, such as government organizations, but is having an increasingly broad reach. Such as recently, there have been many campaigns targeting the aerospace and defense sector, as detailed in the US government's uh, report on the blinding can. And from the financially motivated perspective of Lazarus Group, it's still doing the same kind of campaigns, but having a different avenue of monetizing the results of those campaigns. In particular, all the Lazarus financially motivated campaigns were known for targeting organizations such as large banks with the purposes of compromising their SWIFT systems to forge transactions. Whereas more recently, again, with the US CISA team's release of the Beagle Boys research, which is a subgroup of the Lazarus group, and its financially motivated subset. These detail campaigns that were targeting organizations for the purposes of compromising ATM systems through use of the fast cash malware in order to perform ATM cash out attacks. So what kind of advice can we give to organizations and defenders to try and stop these campaigns? If your organization has the capability to monitor network traffic, because DTRAC uses just HTTP and not something like HTTPS, you can get a quick win out of that. We would also recommend that you don't rule out internal traffic being used for command and control beacons, because as we've discussed, Lazarus C2s have likely been deployed internally on compromised networks. From the perspective of endpoint monitoring, if the tools that your organization uses has the capability to monitor API usage, we highly recommend looking for the usage of specific APIs that are used for code injection and process hollowing. If you can stop track drop before it injects DTRAC into memory, you've stopped the whole thing. Also, look out for the usage of things such as uh, living off the land techniques such as NET, as we saw being used for the KKNPP DTRAC samples being used to exfiltrate data. We also highly recommend that you look for new code signing certificates being used within your organization, as over the last couple of years, we've observed the Lazarus Group either forging or stealing code signing certificates in order to sign their malware and make it more likely to go under the radar. Sorry. What can we recommend to end users as well? Look out for banking and recruitment campaigns uh, that might be targeting you as individuals. We've seen the Lazarus Group, especially in the last year, using fake job applications and sometimes even programs that would generate application PDFs to target individuals. And this is also added to the fact that the Lazarus Group has been seen in open source research recently using LinkedIn as a vector for this. And then for the threat intelligence analysts and reverse engineers like us, we highly recommend that you keep signaturing Lazarus malware. Look for any interesting strings, look for any particular encoding routines, look for all the cryptographic routines that are unique to those samples or unique code chunks. As we've been saying, this code base is developed over time and a Yara rule for one sample may find you many others in the process, and it is highly worth your time, as we have shown with this presentation. To finish things off, we've also provided the MITRE attack mappings for all of the techniques we've observed being used in these campaigns. MITRE attack is an amazing framework, so we'd recommend you check out all of these. And we also provide some indicators of compromise for the various tools that we've been looking at through this presentation in case you want to recreate some of the research yourself. And after the final slide, we also provide all of the references for the various open source blogs and reports that we've been using to help us with this research. Thank you very much for listening and we'll pass back over to the host.